Well, as I said uh, at the uh, end of the fourth uh, plenary, uh, the IISS uh, and also our partners here in the Kingdom of Bahrain were uh, extremely keen uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, a plenary session on uh, the relationship between the, the Horn of Africa uh, and the Gulf. Uh, there'll also be, by the way, tomorrow morning on Sunday, a special uh, session that essentially treats uh, this subject as well with a number of uh, uh, professionals and um, senior civil servants from uh, the countries of the Horn of Africa and those engaged in the region uh, speaking. And the theme of security and competition in the Horn of Africa uh, has become especially uh, important in the last year because there have been a, a number of uh, dramatic changes that have taken uh, place and a new emerging uh, strategic relevance of the Horn of Africa for a variety of, of reasons. It's worth mentioning just a, a couple by way of preface. Of course, one of the most uh, important developments in the region has been the uh, reconciliation and peace between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. This had been a very long-running conflict for a couple of decades. It required uh, a, a great deal of um, uh, diplomatic bravery uh, to conclude uh, uh, this agreement between the two countries, and uh, there was engagement by uh, countries in this region uh, in that process. The United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia were engaged in helping uh, that reconciliation to take place. Uh, ultimately, it was in Jeddah uh, where an agreement was uh, formally signed between uh, the two countries. And there's been a great deal of uh, talk in uh, uh, the morning and the early uh, afternoon about stabilization and reconstruction, but we have countries in this region that have suffered also uh, from the travails of uh, civil war uh, and uh, the activities of non-state uh, actors uh, and their efforts to um, build uh, new societies are ones uh, also uh, important to uh, learn from. And it's also the case that uh, uh, countries that uh, see uh, the growing strategic interests of the Middle East and uh, adjacent territories are uh, not only engaging more uh, economically uh, in this uh, uh, area, China has its uh, Belt and Road Initiative and uh, uh, some elements of the Belt and uh, Road uh, go through or around or uh, in uh, the Horn of Africa and that economic engagement is one uh, that has political and security consequences. And of course, um, some of the uh, countries engaged in the region have uh, developed uh, uh, more direct defense uh, interests. Uh, there's a new uh, Chinese uh, base uh, uh, in Djibouti and uh, uh, a number of countries are engaged in building uh, ports in the Horn of Africa uh, and that competition uh, has uh, given rise uh, to political tensions or alternatively sometimes reflected uh, political tensions that have uh, already existed. So there is uh, a, a linkage between the politics of the Gulf and those of the uh, Horn of Africa, both positively and sometimes uh, negatively, and it's important uh, authoritatively to explore uh, those questions, and that's why uh, having a session on the Horn of Africa uh, is so important at this Manama Dialogue, and we hope uh, that uh, African issues become uh, a more permanent element of the uh, Manama Dialogue agenda. But I thank uh, those uh, uh, joining me uh, on the panel today for being uh, pathbreakers in, in this regard, and I'll ask um, uh, each of them to speak in the order right to left from my perspective there that, that they are uh, on, on the panel. Uh, and I'm really happy to have as our uh, first speaker in this fifth plenary, the Cabinet Secretary for Defense uh, of Kenya, Rachel Omano, and I invite her to take the floor. Uh, heads of delegation, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, from the onset, I wish to thank the chairman of the International Institute for Strategic Studies for inviting me to the 2018 Manama Dialogue. I feel greatly honored to address this vital forum which assembles together a rich and diverse group of powerful policymakers from the Middle East and beyond 
to collectively find solutions to the most pressing security challenges facing the region and its neighbors. I'm delighted that the organizers of this conference considered it important to enrich today's deliberations with perspectives from the Horn of Africa, a complex and exciting area. Ladies and gentlemen, the Horn of Africa is larger than just the Horn proper, which is deemed to comprise of only four countries, namely Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Sudan. In our judgment, it is more useful to define the Horn of Africa in a much wider sense to include Kenya, South Sudan, and Uganda, which form part of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. Collectively, these eight countries have ancient cultural, historical, and geostrategic linkages. This makes it easier for us to sketch a somewhat generalized picture of some of the key security issues confronting the region. Security challenges in the Horn of Africa are a complex mix of deep-rooted internal cleavages, cross-border and global geopolitics. In the past, the region has undergone cycles of conflict relating to struggles for liberation, wars of irredentism and insurgencies, amplified by external intervention and Cold War superpower rivalries. In recent decades, the region has experienced new threats, including human and arms trafficking, piracy, radicalization, and terrorism. The activities of al-Shabaab in Somalia and efforts by the Islamic State to expand its foothold in the region constitutes the most profound security challenges for the Horn of Africa. The situation is further compounded by a seemingly intractable refugee crisis. In addition to this, environmental challenges emanating from climate change, which ignite resource-based conflicts, exacerbate poverty, and spawn protect, uh, protected emergencies. Now, enhancing and sustaining security in the Horn of Africa requires, therefore, a multi-pronged approach, which must, in our view, first include the substantial degradation of al-Shabaab and other extremist groups through sustained support for AMISOM to enable it to conclude its stabilization mandate. Second, the accelerated and coordinated training of the Somali National Army to facilitate an orderly conditioned-based transfer of security responsibilities. Third, the strengthening and support of the Somali federal government and other regional governance and administrative structures in Somalia and in the region with a view to fostering political unity, nationhood, and inclusivity. Finally, concerted efforts must be made across the region to address human security concerns and to invest in and uplift livelihoods. In particular, the underlying causes of radicalization and violent extremism must be confronted and surmounted. Further, the lethal nexus between regional insecurity and issues such as the youth bulge, marginalization, poverty, limited opportunities for economic empowerment, and the exclusion of women must be comprehensively explored, understood, and addressed. However, the primary recipients of the peace dividend in the Horn of Africa must be the ordinary people of the region. There can be no sustainable peace without development. Regional insecurity must therefore be tied to unlocking the vast resources and economic potential of the Horn of Africa. The promise of the Horn of Africa not only lies inland, but also within its territorial waters and oceans. 
It is for this reason that Kenya will hold a high-level conference on the sustainable blue economy from November the 26th to the 28th of this year in Nairobi in order to provide a forum to advance a global conversation on the viable development of the blue economy as a new frontier for development, a new frontier for trade initiatives, as well as to seek out new partnerships for the empowerment of communities in the areas such as the Horn of Africa. The enhancement of maritime security in the waters adjacent to the Horn of Africa, for example, ought to prevent practices such as illegal and unregulated fishing, which only serve to increase poverty and despair in our region. Ladies and gentlemen, our experiences in dealing with security challenges in the Horn of Africa have underlined the importance of partnership and collaboration. The fluid and asymmetric nature of contemporary warfare, together with the transnational character of global security threats, mean that no country or entity can manage its security alone. Within the Horn of Africa, successful innovative peace and security models, which draw on elaborate collaboration between regional governments and the international community have been devised. Cases in point are the Amazon mission, which is an AU-led UN sanctioned mission funded and supported by the EU and other partners. There's also the unprecedented global partnership marshaled to suppress piracy off the coast of, the, of, of Somalia. We are pleased to note that the Horn of Africa is experiencing renewed focus from the international community. Worth mentioning here is a move by external financiers to resume support to the federal government in Mogadishu after three decades of disengagement. We commend the European Union for approving 100 million euro, euros in support of the Somalia government. We also commend the World Bank for approving $80 million in grants to fund public finance. This support forms a significant step towards ailing Somalia's post-conflict recovery, re reconstruction and development, and ought to hasten the strengthening of government and service delivery for the good of the people of Somalia and the region as a whole. We are also excited by the recent signing of the IGAD-led Revi revitalized agreement on the resolution of conflict in South Sudan that has led to renewed hope for the reinvigoration of the peace process in that country. These collaborative efforts couple, coupled with the restoration of, of friendly relations between Ethiopia and Eritrea will contribute towards overall regional peace and stability in the Horn. Ladies and gentlemen, the strategic importance of the Horn of Africa also lies in its proximity to the confluence of some of the world's most important trade routes. In this regard, the Horn of Africa and the Gulf region are inextricably interlinked. Just as the Sahara Desert unites Maghreb Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, the Red Sea has bridged the Horn of Africa and the Middle East, creating a broad-based commonwealth with strong cultural, historical, and social economic ties. It is therefore imperative to consider how to refresh and recalibrate these bonds to ask how best to deploy them towards achieving mutually beneficial goals, especially in the area of peace building, wealth and job creation, trade, innovation, infrastructure development, and social economic progress. In this regard, we would urge the Gulf states to continue to invest in our region and to increase their support to the peace processes in the Horn region. We are convinced that peace and development in the Horn of Africa 
is also critical to the stability and prosperity of the Gulf region and for the security of the logistical and trade routes in the Red Sea, in the Bab el Madeb and Arabian Sea. Consequently, geopolitical rivalries and competing external interests must be skillfully managed so as not to undermine the attainment of these objectives or trigger the deterioration of security in the Horn of Africa. In conclusion, whereas the Horn of Africa has for many years been associated with conflicts and instability, it is concomitantly a place of hope and untapped potential. Its proximity to critical trade routes and choke points means that tranquility in this region has a direct impact on global commerce and security. In addition, peace in the Horn of Africa can create an enabling environment for sustainable regional integration and development, as well as new partnerships. As citizens of this region, we must, in the words of Kwame Nkrumah and Jomo Kenyatta, face forward with courage and become architects of the future. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for that uh, really excellent survey, and we'll want to uh, explore in more detail in conversation uh, the relationship between these eight and uh, uh, the countries of uh, the Gulf. So thank you very much for that. Could I now invite uh, the National Security Advisor of Somalia to take the floor? Thank you, Dr. Chipman, uh, for inviting me. Good afternoon, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Somalia sits as the crossroad between Africa and the Middle East. We are at a strategic vantage point between two regions with potential to become major diplomatic and commercial hub in the future. This afternoon, I would like to set out to you how the challenges and opportunities of Somalia's position manifest themselves and make some observations on how we can turn competition into cooperation to support Somalia's state building and benefit the region. Our strategic and geographic position is both a blessing and a challenge. But first, uh, from a positive pr perspective, Somalia's history, people, and fortunes have always been intertwined with those of Arabian Peninsula. Our proximity to Arabian Peninsula and Gulf neighbors has built strong cultural, social, religious, and brotherly, brotherly relations. For centuries, we have traded ideas, culture, religion, and more recently, we have seen increasing commercial investment and security assistance following from our neighbors across the Gulf of Aden to Somalia. And on our, our African side of the Gulf, it's also a positive time in the Horn of Africa. Somalia can only benefit from closer ties between Ethiopia and Eritrea and from tri tripartite agreements signed by Somalia between Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea to enhance economic, political, social, and cultural uh, cooperation. And a strong bilateral relationship we have with our neighboring uh, Djibouti also. As we move on from a period of frozen conflicts and tolerance for armed opposition movement, Somalia has a role to play in the new era of regional cooperation, maximizing the strategic potential of the Horn of Africa, and building a peaceful and prosperous future across the region and in partnership with our Gulf neighbors. We, have, we also have a growing commercial role in the region. Somalia's coastline is one of our greatest resources for its rich fish stocks, ports, and sustainable energy resources, and beauty. These advantages have enormous potential to contribute 
to Somalia's security and economic growth and to create job opportunities and livelihood for Somali citizens. Gradually, as, we, as Somalia's stability growth, our neighbors and regional partners are recognizing the huge advantages that operating from Somalia can bring. We believe that a new era of Somali regional cooperation is beginning with greater investment in our ports and infrastructure and greater recognition of the diplomatic bridge that Somalia can make between the regions led by uh, our president, Mohammed Abdullahi Mohammed Farmajo. Now, challenges, uh, as well as the cooperation, this new era bring competition and challenges. The current tension between Gulf neighbors have impacted Somalia, both in our external relationship and internal politics. We are acutely aware that Somalia needs all our international partners, and we have no desire to alienate anyone who is willing to work with us for a better future for Somalia. But the current political crisis in the Gulf means that agreements and negotiations involving one of the Gulf parties risks drawing Somalia into crisis. We need to avoid uh, the negative consequences for Somalia at a time when the country remains fragile and to ensure that outside divisions do not undermine our state building efforts. Internally, we recognize Somalis have long standing cooperative relationship with different Gulf partners, but external rivalries have been played out within our borders, causing ad additional complexities to Somalia's uh, both state building and federalism process, enab enabling extremism uh, groups to, to, uh, to take uh, advantage of the divisions. Our proximity to the Gulf neighbors also brings shared security challenges as the conflict in Yemen poses the risk of conflict extending across the Gulf of Aden. Extremists have made use of existing trade networks and short distance across the Gulf of Aden to Somalia's northeastern uh, provinces in, in regions in Puntland and capitalized on lack of state capacity in the remote areas of Somalia to seize territory, impose their ideology, and subject the population to their authority. Terrorism is not only a Somalia fight, it's a regional fight. In December 2017, Houthi rebels in Yemen released a video threatening to strike Berbera up north in the, if, the port was, uh, if the port military was released to the UAE. Puntland and parts of Galmuduk, this is uh, Somali regions, remain the primary entry point for illicit follows of weapons into Somalia. We are seeing smaller, more frequent shipments using existing smuggling routes between Yemen and, and up north in Somalia, Bosasa, as well as the threat from Al-Shabaab. Daesh has also recently expanded its activities in Puntland and in Mogadishu with extortion tar tactics, tactics targeting businesses. We estimate that Daesh collects millions of dollars through extortion of businesses and wealthy individuals in Somalia. Arguably, the greatest challenge facing the Horn of Africa and the Gulf states is how to effectively enable and support our youth population to contribute our stability and prosperity and to give them a brighter future in our interconnected world. Eight, uh, eight out of 10 Somalis are younger than 35 years old, and we have the second highest fertility rate in the world behind Niger. That means our youth population will increase in the coming years with significant implications for the region and the world. The federal government of Somalia is working hard to provide 
jobs, skills development, and alternative livelihood uh, for young people resisting the trap of extremism or the desire to migrate overseas. Through our transition plan to transfer security responsibilities to Somalia, we are building Somalia's security in institutions, combating corruption, implementing inclusive re uh, political reforms, and working, working to rebuild the social contract between the government and its citizens in order to restore trust and counter terrorism. We are making steady prog progress, and we believe that a stable Somalia will have significant benefits to our neighbors in the Horn, the Gulf, and beyond. To conclude, for too long, Somalia has been unable to realize the enormous potential afforded by its strategic location and good relations with proper, prosperous neighbors. I encourage you to reflect on what a stable and prosperous Somalia could bring to the region. It's an, our shared interest to work towards that uh, goal. Somalia is, a is demonstrating our strong political will and emerging capacity to tackle some of our most difficult challenges from a violent insurgence to corruption, to women's rights, to state building, to legitimate governance, to re resilience, to climate events, and to deepening, deepening federalism and to ambitious economic reforms. As Somalia slowly stabilizes and emerges as a capable partner in the region in the interest of our resources and strategic positions will increase. The recent acceptance of Somalia's membership of, of the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, having fulfilled the terms and con conditions of accession to the COMESA Treaty is another indication of how perceptions of, of Somalia are changing with real benefits for development and investment. I encourage you to see Somalia not as it has been in the past, but to see our potential to be the bridge between the Horn of Africa and Arabian Peninsula, and to recognize our unique strategic position with promise to become a commercial and economic powerhouse of the future. We look forward to working with our close partners in the region and build prosperous future for Somalia, which maximizes our strategic position for the benefit of Somalis and for the region and bind us as closer to our regional partners. I thank you. Abdi Saeed Ali, thank you very much uh, for uh, those reflections and for your invitation uh, to us uh, to look forward to uh, the new Somalia that you are working yourself uh, so hard uh, to build. Mr. Belia. Thank you. I think it's, uh, it's good to talk about the Gulf, about, uh, sorry, about the Horn of Africa here in, in Bahrain. Um, there is a, a very long history, uh, three to thousand years, between uh, this part of the world and, and the, the Horn of Africa, the archeological artifacts that you find in, in Yemen uh, and in Ethiopia are the same, the same language, uh, the same writing. More recently, the first followers of Islam, when persecuted in, in Arabia, found refuge in Abyssinia and were warmly welcomed by the, the king of Abyssinia of the day. You mentioned the recent involvement, successful involvement of Saudi and United Arab Emirates in this region with a number of rapprochements, Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea, uh, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Eritrea, uh, Somalia. This region as a whole is important for the EU first, it's about uh, our blood, artera, the commerce between Europe 
and Asia. It's about Suez, uh, Bab el Mandeb, it's about our relation with China, with Japan, with Australia, with ASEAN, with India, countries with whom we have free trade uh, agreement and which uh, constitute something like two thirds of our commerce. Uh, it's also an important region because uh, today the future of Europe is being played in Africa. Uh, if Africa fails, Europe will fail. If Africa succeeds, Europe will succeed. And we have in Africa a very strong institution, which is the African Union, uh, which is doing well. Um, we can't have a resolution at the security in New York today on Africa if it has not been validated by the African Union. And it happens that the main military operation of the African Union in Africa is Somalia. And it was mentioned by the minister from Kenya, it is called AMISOM. And because it is a main African Union operation, we support it. The EU support it. We can't allow the African Union to fail. And the EU up to now in the last years has been uh, uh, contributing to this operation uh, to the amount of 1.7 billion euros and we will continue. The own has been in the last 50 years a very unstable part of the world. We have observed wars between countries, wars between states, Ethiopia, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Eritrea, Djibouti. We have observed conflict within countries, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia. We have observed interferences from foreign actors. Recently, Iran was having uh, relations with Eritrea and then from Eritrea convoy of armament crossing Sudan up to Hamas, some of them being bombed by Israel, so it was part of the big game. We have, and it is a factor of complication in Somalia, Qatar, Turkey doing one thing, and Saudi and Emirates uh, doing another thing, and this is something which will need to be addressed if we want to be successful. At the same time, this region is also a region of hopes, democratization. Kenya is an example of democracy, transition. What is happening now in Ethiopia is about democratization. And I would say what is going on in Somalia is also about democratization. Recently, and when I say recently, I would say last months of years, we, we had two events happening almost at the same time. One is the war in Yemen and the involvement of Iran, the games with the Houthis, which led Saudi and United Arab Emirates to look for partners on the other side of the Red Sea and they found this partner in Eritrea, and they settled a military presence in uh, Eritrea. And the second development is domestic internal dynamic within Ethiopia, disorders coming from youth, especially Oromos. Ethiopia is a country of 100 million inhabitants, and the Oromo part of this country are 50 million. There is a people in Ethiopia called the Oromo and they are 50 million. And they were a little bit marginalized in the social uh, fabric of Ethiopia. They went to the street. The prime minister of that time, Aile Mariam, understood that he couldn't solve it. He passed the end. A new prime minister has been elected and is trying to change things, open up, democratize, new government, new president, difficult exercise, but very worth it. The conjunction of the two events 
Yemen, and domestic situation in Ethiopia has led to where we are today with a very strong role of the USA, a very important role of United Arab Emirates, a very important role of Saudi Arabia, has led to a better relations between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and when we know the past, the war, the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea was like the First World War. It was about trenches, it was about tens of thousands of people dying. We have a beginning, or even more, of reconciliation. The same is happening with Djibouti. It's a little bit more difficult, a little bit more painful. Um, there is not yet confidence. There is something also happening with Somalia. And in fact, if the relations in the region are improving, it can have a positive impact on what is happening in Somalia and on what is happening in South Sudan. The big story in the long term and linked to that story, because the actors are the same, I have mentioned Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. I should mention Egypt, which has always played a very important role in that region. The ultimate price would be reconciliation, or it, we don't need reconciliation, but real good relation between Egypt and Ethiopia. There is more confidence today than yesterday, and it's about the Nile, it's about the dam, it's about the filling of the lake of the dam. We are not far from that, but the average and global improvement of relations in that part of the world can contribute to that. We could have a positive movement global, towards global peace in the region. We have to be careful. We must not rock the Ethiopian boat because Ethiopia is fragile, it must not be done against Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia is a country of 100 million inhabitants. It is a country that in the past has contributed to stability in Somalia, in Sudan, in South Sudan. So we need a stable Somalia, uh, Ethiopia. And in all of this, I think we have to underline and we have to praise Saudi Arabia. We have to praise United Arab Emirates because they are playing a positive role. We need more of them. Sorry to say this, but we need some of their money for Amisom, for education, for secular education in Somali language, because this is the language of this country, for infrastructure, for economic development. We can work, uh, EU, we can contribute to that, we can with the USA contribute to that, and all together maybe have a real impact on this part of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, sweeping strategic perspective and a lot of detail on the intricacies of the diplomacy of the region and the links with uh, uh, the Middle East. I've got a number of questions. Uh, I remind you of the three steps that you need to take. Tap your name badge on the left side of the microphone unit, touch the press the touch screen either left or right, and then press that uh, silver button. If you don't complete the third step, you're not uh, on my list, but those uh, on it now uh, will have uh, the floor. And could I please ask first, uh, Mayor Nowens of the IISS. Yes, thank you, John, and thank you to the three excellent speeches that we've just heard. Um, I'd like to ask more specifically um, the panelists' views about China's role in the region. Um, China has played a cooperative role in the Horn of Africa and in the wider Middle East in the past number of years, particularly through its participation in peacekeeping operations and counter-piracy missions. However, China's security-related engagement has recently expanded in scope, notably through the establishment of a military logistics base in Djibouti, but also through its growing weapons um, and arms exports to the region. So I was wondering how the three panelists view the role of China 
in the stability of the Horn of Africa and the wider Middle East going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, from Singapore, Bilahari Kaushikan. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is very, relate, very much related to the preceding question. Um, East Asia is getting more engaged in the Horn of Africa. You have the BRI, you have the um, Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, the new concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific touches on that region. And a number of analysts have seen this as the extension of East Asian strategic competition into an already complicated region. But I wonder how the countries of the region themselves see this greater East Asian um, involvement. It's, and it's not just Japan or China or India, it is a number of ASEAN countries uh, deploying forces there for anti-piracy and other reasons. So how does countries in the Horn of Africa see the greater involvement of our region, uh, meaning East Asia, in your region, and what advice do you have for us as we go forward? Thank you very much. And from the uh, UN, uh, Pernille Cardel. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to, to the three speakers for, for some very fascinating uh, presentations. Minister Mamu, you were defining the Horn as the members of uh, IGAT, and I'm just wondering, this is a question to all three panelists, um, with the changes that you have described together, whether you see both whether there is a need and whether there's a space and a scope for a stronger IGAT, knowing that some of the reasons why IGAT was kind of held back have been resolved to some extent with some of the changes that are there. And, and if you feel there is a need and a scope for it, what are the challenges that IGAT would be up against in order to get to play that role? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, from the US and also the IISS, Dr. David Gordon. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I've, I have two questions. I think that, that the, the, the very good news here is about uh, both the domestic uh, in, uh, pr progress in Ethiopia and, of course, the, the agreement between Ethiopia and er Eritrea. Um, but the, the situation in South Sudan re remains quite fraught. And, and I'd, I'd like to ask both Mr. Belliard and um, our, our Kenyan colleague to speak a little more specifically uh, about the status uh, of South Sudan uh, and, and where it might be going. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering about uh, the, the impact of the, of the flow of, of extremists out of Iraq and Syria uh, into Somalia and the relationship be, between those groups and Al-Shabaab uh, and, and what the status of uh, the, the struggle r right now against Al-Shabaab is. Thank you very much. And uh, from Algeria, Adel Hamizia. Uh, thanks very much. A uh, couple of questions, if I may. The first question for the colleague from Kenya, um, and it dovetails on a couple of previous questions on China. Um, if you could say a little bit about um, post-FOCAC summit, it transpired that Kenya is the um, uh, third largest uh, indebted country in Africa to China. Uh, the Three Gauges Railway, we heard about issues around um, financing the, the latter parts of the project. What are the perceptions of Kenyans on the ground when it comes to Chinese investment? Um, and how does this compare to, to, to other players when you think about the sort of China-Sri Lanka case recently, the 99-year lease? A uh, question from a colleague from the EU. You suggested that the EU can play a role. I'd be very interested to hear what that is. It seems as if the EU are um, sort of missing when it comes to East Africa. When you think about China, of course, France are in Djibouti, but at, at EU level, it seems as if you, you're, you're hiding away, and if you could say a little bit about that. Finally, the colleague from Somalia, um, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on um, the role of Qatar and Turkey um, in supporting Mogadishu when it comes to uh, perhaps a campaign against other federal member states and where that fits into the GCC crisis, which you alluded to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's a really strong menu already. I've got four or five uh, more questions, but I think that's uh, rich enough to come back to 
the panel with, so I'll do it in, in reverse order, if I may. Uh, Mr. Belliard first, uh, National Security Advisor and Defense Minister. We, in, in the EU, just published a, a strategy on connectivity between Europe and, uh, and Asia, and we mentioned it uh, some days ago in uh, Brussels. There was a summit called ASEM Summit uh, Asia Europe, and we are trying to, we sold it, and we presented it to the Chinese, and it's not against the Silk and Road Initiative, it is another menu, another possibility, and we try, we try to convince the Chinese that uh, what they are doing here and there, and in Africa, is not bad as such. We need investments, we need uh, investment in infrastructures, Africa needs infrastructures, and uh, th if they can provide, fine. But we want to go into the detail of it, on the question of depth, uh, the social uh, aspect, environment uh, aspect, the question of access, reciprocity. Uh, we are working uh, with, with the Chinese uh, on that. Uh, we have joint project with a, a number of international partners in Africa, with Japan, with South Korea. Why not with China, since it, chi Africa is important for, for, for China. Uh, in Ethiopia, what the Chinese have done is impressive. Uh, if you look at it, the train, the tramway, it's not bad at all. If, if it's not about being indebted and, and then a price later on. So we have to look at it, I think, uh, this way, positive way. IGAD, yes. IGAD was not really effective in the absence of Eritrea. Mm. Now that Eritrea could be back, well, what I hear is that uh, the actors of the region want a more political uh, IGAD. This is up to them to say. And by the way, this is something what, where the EU can have an impact. Uh, there was a question about what does the EU do in, in the region. Even when the IGAD was not very effective, we were there supporting IGAD, and we'll continue to support uh, IGAD because we believe in regional uh, organization. It is a framework uh, that can allow the countries of the region to, to work together. South Sudan, you've seen the recently published figures. 400,000 people have died in the last years. It's as, it is like Syria, except that we speak about Syria, we don't talk about South Sudan. There is a peace process, a peace deal, which was broken in Khartoum. Uh, the parties are very divided. I think what we need is a reinvestment, a political reinvestment of the international community. And on South Sudan, I'm sorry to say, but where are the USA? The USA has disappeared from the landscape, and you were in the front at the time of independence of South Sudan. So we need more USA, and we need together, all of us, African Union, IGAD, uh, European Union, USA, the world, to, uh, to work on that. On the terrorist uh, thing, yes, those from uh, Syria, um, Iraq, I think a number of them will go to Libya and then to Sahel and then to Boko Haram. This is the other aspect of it and we must not uh, neglect it. And the second, yes, it's already happening uh, with uh, going to Yemen and from Yemen to Somalia. Some of them, uh, the NSA of uh, Somalia will tell us they have been fighting already in some parts of Somalia and Puntland against some of these elements. So it's something very serious, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on um, in regards to the Chinese role in in the region, I, I think uh, the Chinese speak to the Africans the language they understand, which is uh, we are going to help you with your uh, infrastructure and other other needs immediately. Um, and they do deals uh, that are fast and maybe with with uh, 
certain encouragement and, and maybe less accountability. I don't know. But uh, this is my personal opinion, and, I, and it's faster, it's more efficient, but the, there could be consequences in those agreements. Uh, uh, on, on the extension of uh, East Asia countries in, involvement the, in, in their involvement in the Horn, I think it, it is very welcome if it is uh, because in the Horn, it's strategic. There is a very important choke point, Babel Mandeb is mentioned, and, and it's, it's very important uh, uh, region where it links the, the two regions, and if those involvement are more in, in trade and economic uh, investment, I think that will will improve uh, and, and, and create less uh, contention. And, and then, uh, Bernie's question on IGAD, I, I think IGAD suffers from a structural problem uh, the way it was founded in, in the late 80s. It was to address drought and, and, and famine issues. And then uh, later on, we had the uh, conflicts in the region and so to revitalize I think it's timely with this momentum I think it's the right time uh, and then uh, the question on, on on Qatar and Turkey's role in Somalia uh, there is there was history in Somalia that uh, external actors will will deal directly with in the last 20 something years in the subnational uh, actors in the country and but lately we have been trying to to reform that and the only interlocutor for external actors is the government is federal government of Somalia so some actors accept that, most of the actors. So it's not Qatar and Turkey. Uh, it's Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. All these countries directly deal with the government. And they, uh, and I'm talking about the region in, in the Middle East, uh, they directly deal with the government in, in, in supporting and, and helping the government's plans. So we have we are a government that has its own plans in terms of security, politics, economic, and social. And most of the country's uh, or external support goes through this, uh, this plans. Uh, the internal uh, dynamics in the country uh, change according to the politics of the day. And this is uh, evolving uh, a country that is trying to democratize and establish new institutions. So it takes time for people to get used to the politics uh, internally. And you don't want externals exploiting those uh, political differences, especially at a time like this. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much for the questions that have been asked. I'll tackle one or two of them so that you know we don't have a repetition of perspectives. The questions regarding China, my response would be this. For the longest time, nobody bothered about Africa. Everyone turned their backs on Africa. No one was prepared to, to, to lend Africa money. Uh, no one was prepared to support infrastructure development and so on. The Chinese took a risk. Uh, they provided funding and they have helped Africans build roads, hospitals, railways, and so on. Yes, there are challenges uh, with regard to indebtedness, but that would apply to any donor, wouldn't it, anywhere in the world. I think our concern as Africans is to just be prudent, uh, to focus on doing the right things, and to partner with those who are prepared to hope in you. 
Um, there's a lot of complaints from Western nations about China, but where is, where, where is their money? What are, where is their faith? What are they putting on the table? So I think um, as Africans, uh, we will embrace anyone who's ready to partner with us. Um, and I think it's important that as we do so, we ensure that the agreements we enter into are prima facie in the best interests of our countries. Uh, we will partner with, with um, any country that's prepared to assist us deal with the huge problem of underdevelopment. As long as Africa remains underdeveloped, as long as there are huge disparities between uh, livelihoods in Africa and, and in other parts of the world, then you will see the difficulties that we are seeing in the Mediterranean Sea. You will see human trafficking. You will see extreme conduct going on. The world must accept that you cannot have these huge disparities between continents. You can't have those who are suffering extreme poverty in the midst of plenty. What we have to do is join hands in uplifting lives. As Africans, we are saying, you don't have to give us aid. You can trade with us. Our doors are open to trade, our doors are open to engagement, and we're looking for win-win situations, whether it's between us and the Gulf states, whether it's between us and countries from Asia or anywhere else. So I think the time has come for everyone to think differently about Africa. We, we are not necessarily those who are gonna sit on the sidelines and not get on with it. Our people are too restive, our youth too many. We've got to do something to deal with our challenges. And that will mean engaging in economic agreements with, with, with those who we consider will help us uplift the lives of our people. With regard to IGAD, I think IGAD has played a huge role in stabilizing the Horn of Africa. I think we ought to thank them. I don't think we ought to criticize uh, IGAD. Um, IGAD has been a, a driver of the Somali peace process from the talks that were held in Nairobi to the installation of the, the, the government in uh, Mogadishu. It has been a, a critical player in South Sudan. Um, it, it is, it, uh, IGAD presidents are the first response to emergencies in, in the region. Uh, we need to have these regional organizations so that um, responses can be taken quicker, so that parties are able to engage and discuss their issues directly and are able to find solutions. We cannot continue to be reliant on, 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 on others to solve our problems. Africa has to come of age, we have to be serious, we have to take charge of our destinies, we must engage together at regional level, at bilateral level. It's only when we fail that we need to reach out to external partners. Regarding competition from actors in, um, in, uh, in the Gulf, in, you know, in the Arabian Sea and whatever, our position is that, you know, the entry point uh, for many of these countries that are, are um, operating in, in, uh, in this area was the fight against piracy. And where is the root cause of piracy? It's, it's poverty, it's despair, it's, it's, it's underdevelopment, it's ungoverned spaces, it's weak government, uh, governments. So what the world has to realize is that if you ignore countries, if you, if you, if you turn your back on, 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 on countries that are suffering difficulty, uh, the young people there will, will, will do the, the unimaginable. They will do whatever it takes to survive. So we all need to ask ourselves, where do we think the next hotspots are? Where are the next ungoverned spaces? Where are the next areas of instability and fragility? Um, if they're in the regions where we are, we need to ask ourselves, how could those situations morph into 
uh, radicalization, into extremism, into piracy, into, in, in, into activities that, that will interfere with trade and commerce. Uh, we need to anticipate difficulties. We need to be able to plot in advance so that we don't find ourselves in circumstances where we are behind the game and are busy scrambling to catch up and to defeat um, you know, activities that are negative and that are disruptive to our, our countries. So I'll leave it there. Defense. Uh Minister Omano, thank you very much for that reflection, in particular that very last reflection, because I think uh, your question uh, is uh, a call to intellectual action for all of us who analyze uh, strategic uh, issues. Where are the next ungoverned spaces? How will places morph into new zones of instability? And if I can give uh, one short advertisement for the IISS, we do have a vibrant uh, conflict security and development program and an armed conflict database that is indeed seeking to try uh, to anticipate, uh, not simply record uh, places um, of um, violence. So I think uh, uh, that is an analytical tool that we will wish to continue in collaboration with uh, uh, governments and the private sector and the expert community around the world to refine uh, so that people can anticipate uh, rather than only uh, react. So thank you for that uh, call to intellectual action, which we hope uh, to respond to. I'll take uh, a few more and then give each of the panelists one minute uh, to leave us uh, with their most important uh, thought for the afternoon. But to uh, animate them, uh, first, uh, could I invite uh, Nick Childs? Thank you, John. I'd, I'd like to focus on the maritime aspects, so um, the issues that we've been talking about in the, in the region. We, we've heard how uh, economic activity in the region is, is migrating into the maritime space, how the instabilities uh, of the region are also uh, migrating into the maritime space and also escalating and moving from piracy to broader concerns about maritime traffic interdiction and uh, potentially even uh, missile strikes against general maritime traffic. We've heard about the fact that this is a strategic uh, choke point and that is reflected in growing uh, extra regional activity in terms of naval presence and uh, investments in, in port infrastructure. Um, of course, this is also a region that has seen some models of uh, maritime cooperation to deal with, uh, things like counter piracy, the EU At Atalanta mission, the coalition maritime forces um, uh, activities. Um, but is that enough? I, I, I put, pose the question to the panel in general. Is that enough now, or is there a requirement to uh, be proactive in bringing together a, a new initiative to avoid those particularly strategic uh, uh, interests and uh, stakes in the region uh, translating into, I think uh, Minister Omamo made the point of uh, greater geopolitical rivalries rather than future cooperation. Yes, what happens in the maritime space is to some extent a symptom, but it's how uh, outside powers are involved and engaging in the region uh, is leading potentially to greater naval rivalry rather than cooperation in the region. Thank you. And from Pakistan, Jalila Bastilani. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, one of the most significant challenges uh, that has been highlighted by the panelists is the radicalization of societies in the horns of Africa, Africa and, and the emergence of uh, violent extremist groups. With Horn of Africa becoming a theater of uh, competing interests, and the fact that there is tension within the countries of the region, there is a possibility that with the passage of time, these groups may gain strength. I was wondering if there is any strategy which is being developed either by the countries uh, concerned or those competing forces uh, to ensure, to address this phenomena, and also to ensure that uh, uh, these groups which have emerged in the last couple of years, they are not used by these competing forces for the promotion of their own respective interests in the Horn of Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dana Allen. 
Thank you, John. Um, to Minister Amamo, Amamo and Mr. Ali, you both very briefly mentioned uh, the challenge of climate change, which is something that um, the Omani foreign minister also, um, also highlighted. Um, it, it, it strikes me that um, in, in both of your moderately optimistic uh, uh, presentations or moderately upbeat presentations, um, this is a looming challenge that it, it, it is, is likely to greatly impact um, your region and your countries. And I wonder if you could just say something more about, about how you see this, this challenge and threat. James Hackett. John, thanks. I've got uh, two questions. First, to the National Security Advisor from Somalia, and second, to the Cabinet Secretary from Kenya. Um, building on the early questions a little to the NSA from Somalia, could you discuss in a bit more detail the government's position on security assistance requirements from Gulf states? What are the practical needs of the Somali security forces that you think Gulf states can fill? And could you also elaborate on Mogadishu's position over the reports of the UAE military base near Berbera? particularly the reports of a related deal to train Somaliland forces. What's your government's position on this, not least the impact it might have on potential plans for eventual reunification? And on Kenya, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you said that there should be an orderly and conditions-based transfer of authority in Somalia. And I wonder if you could say a little more about the security conditions that Kenya sees as necessary for that to take place, particularly what measure of decline in al-Shabaab activity would you see as acceptable? Thank you. Thank you. Koi Shaki? One of the challenges of American foreign policy is getting the balance right in the tools that we bring to help friendly governments, and in particular in areas where there are emergent or existing security concerns. Very often, American military partnership outpaces the diplomatic and economic elements of American policy, causing civil-military friction or stunted development and destabilization of governments. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary from Kenya and the, and the National Security Advisor of Somalia have any concerns about American engagement with your countries in that regard, or whether, in particular, whether they're needs to be a rebalancing of American tools as we engage with your countries. And finally, Tsukmin Lee. Thank you, John. Uh, my question goes to Secretary uh, Obama. It's been five years after the Westgate tragedy, and your National Intelligence Service Director has said that terrorism is the single biggest threat to Kenya's security. Could you give us a brief overview of your government's success in fighting terrorism over the last five years and the resources that your government is devoting towards counterterrorism in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, Monsieur Belliard, uh, who answered a lot of questions, has ceded his time uh, to our two other panelists because uh, most of the questions uh, were to the National Security Advisor and the Cabinet Secretary for Defense. So, I'll give each of them three minutes uh, to address uh, those important issues. First, uh, National Security Advisor, and we'll conclude with Cabinet Secretary Omona. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, uh, I, will, I will cover some of the questions that the uh, director asked. Uh, on maritime um, uh, question, is that enough now, or is there uh, other initiatives that we can do now? Um, it's not enough. Uh, the, certainly, the, the the maritime operations have helped uh, tackle the pirates, the active par piracy um, on, on the coast of Somalia, but it hasn't addressed the root cause of the problem. Uh, the illegal, uh, unreported, unregulated fishing uh, trawlers are roaming the, the coast of, of Somalia. Uh, they are uh, toxic waste are dumped on the coast of Somalia. Uh, there are environmental damages, there is economic damages, and there is a uh, threat to, to basically the livelihood of, of the population, it's the coastal communities there. So there has to be uh, new initiatives. On, uh, on, on our uh, strategies, a couple of uh, mentioned, a uh, couple of 
you mentioned about, or asked what is your uh, strategy on, on, on external actors or extremists or, or other actors uh, in terms of our countries. We, we, I just want to highlight that we are trying to uh, focus in, in, in trying to build a new mindset in Somalia. We are, we are not doing business as usual. And this is that the decision making and priorities are set by the Somalis. And Somalis represented by their government. And this, this new mindset is that the, the support, the secu whether it's su economic support, political support, or security support assistance, it, will ha it has to support our initiatives. Uh, in the past, you had ad hoc uh, projects uh, implemented by actors, uh, not aligned with the government priorities, which caused a lot of uh, problems. And this is the only way that uh, our political agenda will, will, will be more legitimate and we can build long, more uh, inclusive uh, politics in the government across the country. So we are, we are trying to, uh, there is of course security assistant, uh, uh, security financing policy that the government recently has established which basically means that the, any uh, security support has to be aligned with the government's priorities. So if it's not aligned, then uh, thank you, but we, we want you to keep that money. Uh, on, on, on the support of the US, um, um, US engagement in Somalia, uh, since uh, this government took, took over, the, the American support was and is, has been very helpful in, in, in targeting and making sure those um, uh, individuals that are threat to the population uh, were, were taken out or, or, or dealt with. Uh, this this military and, and drones and support uh, is very effective and it has been very effective. Some of you might know that last year, uh, 2017, uh, October 14, we had major, uh, major uh, uh, explosion uh, in, inside Mogadishu where over 500 uh, civilians were killed. And this was major disaster in, in, in Somalia. Some, and some of the perpetrators were, were, were dealt with, uh, either captured or, or, or dealt with, by, with this support. Uh, but that, the military solution is not the only uh, solution. So that's why we have comprehensive uh, strategy, which means having uh, local governance, local livelihood, local uh, reconciliation, local uh, ju uh, justice system. So it has to have, it has to complement other uh, components. Thank you. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Omamo. Thank you for the questions. Um, with regard to the maritime aspects, I don't think that um, the buildup of navies in the in the Horn of Africa region necessarily translates to maritime security for the ordinary people of the Horn of Africa. What we need to do is to develop coast guards and to be able to share maritime domain, domain awareness across uh, the coastlines that are, are comprised in the Horn of Africa. We need to invest in ordinary people. We need to invest in those who are interested in conducting fishing, we need to upskill individuals. Like I said during my presentation, the, 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 na the navies in the Horn of Africa are bringing about a false type of security because it is not security 
that, are, that is building resilience amongst ordinary people. Piracy is conducted first by young individuals and then it morphs into organized crime and transnational breaches of the law. You've got to invest in people. You've got to transform lives. And I think those who are operating on our seas need to work with our governments to do the right thing, to enable us to provide security for ourselves. This is the reason why we have thought it absolutely necessary to have a Blue Economy Conference, so that we can address that aspect of maritime security. Setting up Coast Guards is extremely expensive. Training new personnel is extremely expensive. So somehow, as Africans, we're going to have to share assets, resources, personnel, and financing. It's only then that we'll really have the type of maritime security that speaks to the needs of ordinary people. The navies in the uh, Arabian Gulf, in the, in the Somali basin, are not interdicting trawlers. They're not stopping illegal dumping of toxic waste. They're not. Because those issues are not imperative to them. Their interests are different. I think everybody's interests needs to be, need to be put onto the table. And we need to join hands to ensure that there are win-win solutions for everyone in the Gulf of Aden and, and the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea. Everyone's got interests and we need to be able to have a confluence on minds as to how best to articulate those interests for the benefit of people in the region. Regarding radicalization, I think we're all concerned about radicalization. We are concerned about the movement of fighters from different zones of conflict. We must again join hands and share intelligence as to where these people are going. We know that um, radicalization finds roots in ungoverned spaces. We know that it finds roots in places where there is weak, where, where states are fragile. We know that radicalization um, merges with, uh, with despair, with inequality, with mar marginalization. We need to work on all these things and we need to cooperate uh, across the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. Here, uh, there are solutions that can be found. Uh, we are all friends, we are all uh, crusaders for peace and stability, and we can share learnings, we can share practices, uh, we, we, we can engage for peace as a collective. So I would urge those who um, are, are um, working on, on this area, uh, working on research, uh, that begins to unpack radicalization in different parts of Africa, to share research uh, with us, to share research with African countries, with the AU, so that we can exchange learning, so that we can dialogue, and so that we can put into place best practices to do with radicalization. But at the end of the day, our experience has been the radicalization is primarily connected to underdevelopment in our region anyway, and we must be able to change that paradigm by uplifting the lives of our people. Regarding climate change, we see climate change as a huge threat. Um, you know, the weather is unpredictable. Most of our agriculture is rain-fed. In our country, we are putting into place very clear policies to facilitate food security for our people. We have to change the way we farm. We have to change the seeds we grow. We have to um, harvest water uh, and so on. Um, we consider that if we're not careful, the next wars that will be fought in Africa will be over water. Uh, the most lethal conflicts will be over resources. So we need to protect our forests. We need to ensure that uh, uh, we conserve the little water that we have. And we need to be able to build up a critical mass of professionals that will help our people build resilience 
against climate change. I think this is uh, a matter that is concern for the entire world, because climate change is not only restricted to Africa and the Horn, it's a problem that uh, the whole world is confronting. So we all need to begin to ponder about what will happen in your own areas of the world if climate change takes its toll. Um, someone had asked about uh, condition-based uh, uh, issues in, in Somalia. I think the, co the position of all the Amazon true contributing countries is basically this, that Amazon has done a great deal in degrading Al-Shabaab. It has liberated lots of towns and areas from Al-Shabaab. We are not keen on a rushed and uncoordinated drawdown of Amisom because we think that if this is not managed appropriately, then all the gains that have been made will be lost. So what we are saying is that we need to strengthen the Somali National Army. We are grateful to all the partners that are engaged in this process. The stronger the army is, the better it will be able to hold ground, the easier it will be for us to draw down without thinking that everything that has been done over the last 10 years will go to waste. It's, it's a tricky situation, but it's one that we can engage in um, as a collective, and we need to, be, to ensure that we do not leave uh, Somalia vulnerable, that we leave it as a strong country, uh, and that uh, um, we, we leave uh, administrative units that are are able to provide the governance required. Uh, the people of Somalia and indeed from the whole of Africa are really resilient and innovative people. What they need is peace. What they need is the ability to be able to engage in development processes and to improve their lives. Minister Omamo, um, can I thank you for that um, inspiring conclusion. Uh, I know there are one or two uh, issues that haven't been fully answered, but what I can say is that we have had uh, in the last uh, hour and 20 minutes an extraordinary uh, analysis, not only of the challenges and opportunities of the Horn of Africa, but of the special uh, linkages of the region uh, with uh, the Middle East and indeed uh, the Indo uh, Pacific. I want to thank the three of you for uh, addressing these questions with such strategic perspective and in such uh, detail. And I hope everyone here will join me in thanking you for that. With that, we uh, draw to a conclusion today's uh, extraordinary uh, debate and discussion. Uh, there will be, for some, a private uh, dinner tonight. If uh, you are in a pos possession of an invitation that looks like this, uh, please assemble in the foyer immediately outside, not the general uh, foyer of the hotel, and transport will be available uh, to take you uh, to dinner from there. Please don't be late. Please do bring uh, this invitation with you. Uh, and uh, for everyone else, uh, thank you for your contribution to uh, the debate. I hope everyone has a splendid dinner, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning.